You know, we, we kind of encourage you to be free in your worship here, and, and uh, it's okay to raise your voice and raise your hands and shout hallelujah and, and just let the Holy Spirit work through you. We've even from time to time done things like this, you know, and, and you just do it every time. Amen. You know what? And even this one, radicals. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, now was your motivation in saying those things just because I held the sign up, or is it something that's going on deep inside? Because you can just repeat things, and you can say, oh, man, look at this. Aren't they enthusiastic? But, you know, and, and these are all good things, but when it comes right down to it, our response and the enthusiasm that we, in, that we use and employ when we follow Jesus has to come from a genuine relationship with Him. Because there are days you don't feel like saying hallelujah, whether someone holds up a sign or not. There are days that everything just isn't going like you think it should go. But you know what? We are to be praisers at, at all times. I'm, I'm so weary of just hearing the complaining thing. Uh, you know, talking your ear off about how bad things are. Anybody ever have, don't look around. Anybody <laughs> ever have anybody do that to you? They're spinning your ear. And if you try to help them with a solution, oh no, no. Just want to complain. Just want you to know how bad my life is. But you know, as believers in Jesus Christ, we can live above that. Amen. And we're called to live above that. You know, over the next, today and over the three weeks that will come, we're going to be revisiting our core values, uh, the things that we set into place uh, back when we went through that year-long process with our Acts 2 journey. And uh, we could have selected about 50 core values, couldn't we, for those of you who are part of that team, uh, because there were a lot of things that were genuinely true. Uh, core values are not things that we wish we were. Core values are the things that we hold dear now. Uh, down the road, it's good to reflect on these and say, maybe we need to tweak some. Maybe we found a new depth in some of these core values. Maybe we need to add a couple more to the list. But for our purposes here, I want to take some time and just kind of look at these again. And the very first one, these aren't in order of importance, just in order of the way you see them uh, when you see the the core values printed all over the, the building here. And that is, we think it's important that we are passionate, that we're genuinely excited about following and serving Jesus. And you know what? You can't really do that by holding up a sign. You can't really do that just by saying, okay, now everybody do this, you know. It, it's something that is much deeper than that. It's something that comes as you continue to seek Him with, with your whole heart. It genuinely is the key word, excited about following and serving Jesus. We can, uh, we can build emotional hype, and we can jump and shout, and there are times that emotions do have a role to play, and there's nothing wrong with getting excited in the house. And, and sometimes, you know, you may even, if you see me dance, it is the Spirit, because I have no ability whatsoever to dance. But I mean, there are things that we do, she preaches, she says, there are things that, that we do, and that some of that is that our emotions are so reached, but we don't live by those. There's got to be something deeper than that. Because if there's not, you leave the room, and you go back in the same old miserable existence you had before you came in. So it's more than just forcing ourselves to do things. It's understanding what God has created for us to walk into. It's understanding that He loves you just the way you are, Think about this for a second. There's nothing you can do to make God love you more. That's not to say, that's not to say that there aren't areas that he wants to work on and wants you to give him. But as far as the love of God, there's nothing you can do to make him love you. He loves you. And, and we're not used to that. Because we think with people, you know, well, maybe, you know, maybe I can get my spouse to act like they love me again if I do this or that. And that may be true, but 
With God, his love is not based. It's not conditional. It doesn't mean that he approves of sin. He can't look upon sin. It, it doesn't mean that, that, that his word isn't true. It doesn't mean that he wants to just leave you where you're at. He wants you to grow up in him. But there's nothing you can do and no amount of works that you can do to make him love you more. When that gets into your spirit, that makes you passionate. <laughs> right? When you, when you consider what God did in Jesus Christ for you, and that he went up, when you consider what God went through, that he became flesh, that the Son who was eternally existent with the Father, the Son who was an agent in creation, took on flesh, came to earth, was born as a baby, was named Jesus, is Messiah. And, and, and all of that was done before you or I were born. Wow, that blows your mind. These kind of things, when they settle deep into your spirit, these are things that will make you passionate. When you realize that there's nothing that you could have done in your past that makes it impossible for you to come before him now. Amen. That'll make you passionate about following and serving Jesus. If Jesus is just a way, if Jesus is just an option, if Jesus is one of many pathways to enlightenment, you're not going to be passionate and excited about following and serving Jesus. But he is the only way because he's the only one that met all the qualifications for one who could become propitiation. There's a $10 word for our sins. One who had the necessary characteristics to be able to become the sacrifice for sin because he was God in the flesh. So when we look about being passionate, it starts deep down inside. I wasn't going to go through all of that. That was extra. <laughs> but I'll try not to make things go too long today. In uh, three of the synoptic gospels, there's, there's an account that I want to talk about just a little bit today. Uh, we find it in Mark 10, Matthew 19, and Luke 18. And we often uh, name this story the story of the rich young ruler. It's interesting because the only thing the Bible really tells us about him is that he was rich. And I want you to ignore, for purposes of better understanding this person, I don't know about you, but I grew up in Sunday school with the flannel board. Anybody? And the rich young ruler was in robes and a hat, and he had attendants with him, and he had jewelry on, and he was white blue-eyed European. I want you to get that picture out of your mind if it's there. Let's just say that he was a man. And this man had a lot of wealth. He had a lot of things in this life. Doesn't matter if he was young. It doesn't matter if he was in charge or ruler, although by his wealth he probably was in charge, of, had people under him. But let's just think of him as a man who recognized that something was missing in his life. And he was trying to figure out what that might be. And with that, I want to read Mark's version today. It's on your screen. Mark 10. Uh, at just verses 17 to 22, at least for now. As Jesus was starting out on his way to Jerusalem... A man came running up to him, knelt down, and asked, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good? Jesus asked, Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not murder. You must not commit adultery. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. You must not cheat anyone. Honor your father and mother. Next. Next slide. Well, wake up, teacher, the man replied. I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. There's still one thing you haven't done. He told him, go and sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell, and he went away sad, for he had many possessions. Um, It's interesting in the three different versions of this in the other Gospels, if you make that note to, to follow it up, in Matthew 19, some of the manuscripts, the Greek manuscripts from Matthew, re- rephrase the beginning of this. And instead of saying, good teacher, the man says, teacher, what good thing must I do? Um, the other two will come and say, good teacher. And Jesus asks this question, doesn't he? And it, it sounds a little strange to us. Why do you call me good? Maybe it's because we hear it in a certain tone. We hear it as, why are you calling me good? I don't believe that's how he asked it. I believe he was trying to get to the heart, to the intentions of this young man. And I believe if we take all the emphasis out of it and just hear what he was asking, why do you call me good? I, I think he did this to, to create an awareness that this young man, or this man, or this rich man, or whatever he was, was not coming for a genuine desire to follow Jesus. He was coming to figure out, what else do I have to do? Or, what's the least I have to do? Right? Right? So, Mark's version alone says that Jesus looked upon him and loved him. So, when we hear the reply that Jesus gave the man, understand there is love in Jesus' heart for the man. The truth of God's Word can can be very offensive to those who are living in sin and don't want to be challenged. There is a large society of people today that thinks that we are haters, because we say that certain things are wrong. It has nothing to do with hate. Maybe from some people it does, but following Jesus, it's not hate. So, when we think of what Jesus said to this man, we have to understand the love with which he was speaking to this man. I think it's interesting that even amongst the three gospel versions, there are some differences in, in the, the commandments that Jesus lists. Here in Mark, uh, it, the, 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 the cheating, cheat, one, you must not cheat, you must not defraud, depending on your translation. And that doesn't appear in Matthew, and it doesn't appear in Luke. Thou shalt not defraud is not one of the Ten Commandments, right? But there are other commandments. Uh, In Matthew's, it doesn't say cheat or defraud, but it adds love your neighbor as yourself. And that certainly is not part of the Ten Commandments in as far as a line, but it is part of the commandments of God. Matter of fact, Jesus said it was one of the greatest The thing to notice, though, depending upon whatever translation you're reading, there's one thing that holds true in all of this list of commands that Jesus gave. The one thing that is true is they all have to do with how you relate to other people. These are all commandments and how we reach and how we relate to one another. There is something missing there, and that is the commandments that deal with man's relationship to God. And he says, what must I do? I I truly believe that this man thought, you know, I'm doing all the things they told me to do. He was a good Jewish boy trying to keep the law and trying to keep the commandments. And and he said, something's missing. There must be one thing I'm missing. What could it be? And here comes Jesus, a, a teacher who is developing quite a following. And this man may have been the first person to say, maybe I could just hear from Jesus and then just add that on to what I've already got going. He might have been the first one to actually try to do that. Happens all the time today. 
when you treat Jesus as an option, when, when you never submit and give your life to him, and, and you figure, well, I'll just kind of jump through some hoops, and then, and then I'll wait and see if my life gets better. That's adding Jesus on, right? So, I, I love it. He gives him this solution. It, uh, verse, verse 21 says, he looks upon him with love, right? And he gives him a solution. He says, sell all you have and give it to the poor. Now, that's not a blanket commandment. Nowhere do we read that we are to live a life of absolute poverty. This is not a blanket commandment. This was not something in Exodus or in Leviticus where it said, sell everything you have if you want to follow the Lord. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. Now, there are commandments as far as how we should handle our money and how we should take care of the poor. But what he gave this young man, that, that's not something that appears as a blanket statement. This was for him, right? Sell all you have, get to the poor. See, Jesus knew the man's heart. He, he knew what was in the very foundation of, of who he was. And he knew that. By the way, we don't know that. That's biblical being judgmental, biblically. Being judgmental is not making a decision based on what God's already said. That's not judgmental. That's what the world thinks. But being judgmental is assuming you know the heart of somebody else. But Jesus is allowed to do that because he's God. He knew the man's heart. He knew the limit of the man's price. He knew how far he'd go, right? He knew the true source of the man's identity. That there was the fact that he was wealthy, that was who he was. That defined this man. First and foremost, beyond anything else, Jesus knew the limit of the man's true passion for God. And he knows our hearts just the same way as he does this rich man that came up to him. You know, the passion with which you follow and serve Jesus is determined by what you're willing to let go of for it. The passion with which you follow and serve Jesus is determined by what you're willing to let go of for it. When we talk about passionate and, and, and genuinely, right, serving, worshiping, and, and honoring, and speaking out for Jesus is determined by what you're willing to let go of. Some people are not willing to let go of what other people think about them. Some people are not willing to let go of their identity. Some people are not willing to let go of all of the lousy stuff that's happened to them in the past. Some people are not willing to let go of the things that people have done against them. Some people are not willing to let go of their own past. And so it affects the, the way that they passionately serve Jesus. And, and they may, those kind of people may look at other people that are just so free and excited about Jesus, and they're the ones that volunteer right away on the sign-up sheets. Yes, I want to be a part. I love some of the, uh, uh, the, the responses we got about our new midweek thing. The one question that said, what would keep you from this? Someone said, death. <laughs> Somebody else said, death or the rapture. Man, that's passion, Right? And that doesn't come from somebody saying, I want you to serve. That comes from what God is doing in your hearts, right? Willing to let go of my time, my money, uh, the day of the week that we do this. It's a faith thing. It's a faith thing. Jesus said to his disciples after he had this conversation with the man and after the man walked away in verse 23, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. The, the young man asks the question, the rich man, I'm doing it, aren't I? I'm doing what I've always heard, the rich young man. The rich man uh, asked him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What must I do to live forever? And, and the Greek word that 
is translated life can mean the life here and now, but it can also mean forever. And I think it's interesting um, that we could say, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life, to have this given to me, and then contrast that with the act of entering the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven? Because there is a difference. There is a difference. The kingdom of heaven is now and yet it will be. The kingdom of God goes beyond national boundaries, right? The, the kingdom of God goes beyond our nationality. The kingdom of God uh, is in spite of the bondage that other people may be putting on us, whether that's a mortgage company, <laughs> a prison warden, or an addiction. Entering the kingdom of God is not as much about dying and going to heaven as it is entering into a new way of living, a new way of thinking, a new way of loving, a new way of prioritizing, all of this stuff. So I wonder sometimes if, if this man was not just kind of thinking, I want to keep doing everything I'm doing, but I want to make sure when I die I go to heaven. I mean, a lot of people must think that or else they wouldn't ask stupid questions. Like, can I smoke and still go to heaven? And Yeah, you can. You just get there quicker. <laughs> but, but why even bring it up, right? Can I not show up in church every week and still go to heaven? Well, yeah. Yeah, there's not going to church. It says don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together. But if you're in the kingdom of heaven and living in the kingdom of God, why would you not want to get together with other believers and come together and worship together and lean on one another? Why would you want to put things in your body that aren't supposed to be there, right? So if you're looking to just kind of get out of hell free, that's a totally different, you're not going to be passionate if you're just looking to get out of hell free. And I don't know this young man, this man, uh, keep doing that, I wouldn't, I don't know exactly what he was thinking, but by his reaction when Jesus told him to go sell his possessions and give money to the poor, the fact that he, he, his face fell and he went away sad makes me think that he really wasn't looking to enter the kingdom of God. He was just looking to make heaven after his life was through. Verse 48, verse 28, Peter says, we've, we've given up everything. It's scaring the disciples. We've given up everything to follow you. And Jesus says, yes, and I assure you that everyone who has given up house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or property for my sake and for the good news will receive now, now, in return, a hundred times as many houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, property, along with persecution. And in the world to come, that person will have eternal life. See, Jesus divides the answer for his disciples. He talks about the now. The now is living on this earth, living in flesh, but yet walking in the kingdom of God. And Jesus promises anyone who gives up the things that they're hanging on to for his sake will receive more, not just a little bit more, but he said we'll receive a hundred times now. Now, we can take that and twist it around and say, okay, I'm going to give him a house. He's going to give me a hundred. No, he's going to give you the value of a hundred times more of what you let go of. And the value some of that can be finances, some of that can be uh, positions, some of that, but, but think about it. It's going to be influence for God's kingdom, influence for his honor and for his glory. So if we come to him and say, I've given up everything, he says, that's right. And now, in the Greek it means now, now that you will receive that in this life and then eternity eternal life. There are blessings that come our way 
when we're willing to let go of what we so hang on to that keeps us from being passionate for Jesus. And those blessings are, are ones that the world may look, as, look at as intangible. Because what do we do for the child of God? If, if God blesses you with $100,000, you, you may choose to, you know, pay off some bills or whatever, but if your mind and your heart is committed to reaching others, you're going to take some of that money, hopefully most of it, right, and, and use it for kingdom causes. If someone drops a million dollars on us as a church, we're going to invest it in souls, Amen. right? And to some people that may look ridiculous, but just look at what could be done if every believer in Christ took that attitude. I'm willing to let go of some things that I thought meant so much to me, but really in the scope of eternity are not going to mean anything. We're not earning a place in heaven. Get that out of your mind. It's the passion that we follow Jesus with that says, my life on earth has to count more for than just having a pretty corpse when I die. Amen. Right? I, I, want the, I want my life to mean something. I, I want what I do here. I want the resources that God gives me. I want that to mean something in the kingdom of God. Amen. Jesus gives us salvation, freedom from hell, and, and, and guarantees us that we will not have sin's penalty when we end our life here on earth. And as long as we stay in Christ, we are guaranteed that. So let's stop thinking that we're, you know, <laughs> earning a place in heaven. We're not. But when you see what God has done for you, and you're willing to let go of some of the things that the world thinks are so important, and your heart goes to making disciples for Jesus Christ. Those are the blessings that Jesus is talking about a hundred times more than anything that you give up, and it is now. Something else we have to get out of our minds is that it's not just by and by in the sky when I die. It's now. Amen. Nothing's going to be perfect here. We know that. The Bible gives us warnings of some things that are going to happen. We look at our world today and we can see things that really bother us and they irritate us down deep in our spirit. And, and we're not talking that that's all, all going to be fixed. However, there is so much potential in this life to let God use you to be creative, to reach people that have given up on God. And, and that means that we have to be passionate about doing what He wants to do. And you're not going to be passionate by coming to a church service or responding to a sign or just doing what other people do or jumping up and down or yelling or any of that stuff. That may be part of what you do, but that in itself is not going to make you passionate. Your passion is going to make you respond in these outward ways. Let's not get it backwards. God doesn't bring persecution. Our enemy does. Those persecutions don't have to cripple you. Jesus said, along with persecutions. If you do something for the Lord, people are not going to like you. <laughs> Get over it. <coughs> Get over it. You're not going to change people's minds about you. It's an exercise in futility to attempt to do it. If you're doing what God has called you to do, expect some pushback. You will survive. The persecution does not come from God. Jesus is not saying that I'm going to give you these blessings, but I'm also going to give you persecutions. Not at all. He's saying persecutions are going to happen. I think sometimes <laughs> people are so worried about what other people think of them. And this does not give us an excuse to just be mean and nasty. That's not Christ-like. But you're not going to make everybody happy. I've heard people say, as a pastor, to me and to other pastors, well, you can't keep everybody happy. It's not my job. Right. It's nowhere in my job description to make people happy. It's not. Now, not in my job description to tick everybody off either. But it's not part of the deal. Part of the deal is preaching the gospel. Not Tim's gospel. The gospel of God, right? So you know what? If, if that's keeping you from holding back and, and serving the Lord, if that's keeping you from letting that passion uh, roll up inside of you, you know what? 
Someone is going to say something about you, and five minutes later, they're going to forget you even exist. So let it go. Let it go. I don't know if it means anything or not. (laughs) But in Matthew, and in Mark, and in Luke, each case where this account is written about, it follows the same story. In all three Gospels, immediately preceding the story of this rich man is Jesus with the children. They were trying to keep the kids away. And he said, no, no, no. Let them come. And he said, if you don't have faith as a child, you can't inherit the kingdom of God. And then here comes this rich man. I don't know how soon after the, the, the thing was with the kids. You know, we see movies about this, and we'll see it happen one from the other. I, I don't know how much time has elapsed. But I think it's interesting that in all three gospel accounts, it's in the same order. We complicate things as grown-ups. We complicate things. Yeah, but if I let go of this, then I'm not going to be able to do this. And that becomes the sticking point. If I go all out and I just absolutely praise God with my lips, if I ask Him to fill me with His Holy Spirit, if I start speaking in tongues, if I start manifesting gifts, all these people are going to think I'm crazy. They already think you're crazy (laughs) for coming into this room on Sunday morning. So just give them more fuel. Well, what, what if I don't you know, get that $1,200 truck payment. People are doing this. What if I get a $300 car payment and give the rest to the work of the ministry? I won't have that new truck. And, right? We have to think like children. My God is going to supply everything I need. My dad, my mom, is not gonna, are not going to let anything bad happen to me. Isn't that what kids think? And we grow up and we become adults and we find out that we're able to do some things on our own and we start thinking that we can do everything on our own. And that's usually when we get into trouble. I think it's neat that right after Jesus said, Faith as a child is what it takes. We come upon this rich man who in his case, his riches, his earthly possessions were his everything. And he was trying to figure out what can I do to get rid of some of this guilt I'm feeling and not have to give up all of this. And Jesus disappointed him because he didn't give him the answer that he had wanted. I think today we ask Jesus, what more do I need to do to enter the kingdom of God? So let me, let me give you a little reprieve and a little exhale. It's not about what you do. It's not about what you do. That's, that's like The wagon pulling the horse. It's not what you do. It's who you are. Deep down inside. It's your heart motivations. It's what is most important. What am I willing to let go of? Because that's the level of your passion. And you know what? This is not something that we say, oh, now I've achieved a greater passion for Jesus. No, it's that God's finally getting through to us through our thick heads sometimes. Here's how you're supposed to live. Here's how I've designed for you to live. Here's how you're going to be happy. Here's how you're going to be fulfilled. Here's how you are going to just get to a point where you just step from one existence into the next when your time on earth is through. I'm going to save you a lot of anxiety I'm going to save you a lot of stress. I'm going to save you a lot of worry. God says, if you just do things my way, 
He has, just like God has created everything that we see in six days, He has also created everything that we need for life and godliness when Jesus hung on the cross. And we just have to trust Him and go. Come into the place where God heals. Come into the place where God speaks. Come into the place where God delivers. Understanding it's not a physical place in a building, but it's a place in our minds where we say, I am going to serve you with everything I have. I'm going to take you at your word. I'm going to trust you more now than I ever have before. What do you think might happen if you trusted him completely? One of our core values is dream big, then dream bigger. That'll be in a couple of weeks. Sometimes we dream bigger without dreaming big. You know what dreaming big is? God honors his word. His word is true. If he said that he'll give you a brand new life, uh, that if you simply respond to his invitation in faith, he will. If he, if he says that he will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, he will. If he said by his stripes you were healed, that's his statement to you. We simply come into the place where God can do in and through us what he wants to do. And man, we dig through those layers and we're willing to let our passion be ignited by realizing the things that we're hanging on to that are keeping us back. Man, oh man, think about it. A hundred times as much as you set aside now, not to mention eternity with him.